Andrea. Hi. Hello. 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 How are you? Good. How are you? Good. I'm Allison. I'm one of the owners here at Fabled. Thank you so Hi, much Allison. for being a part of this today. Oh, I'm thrilled to be invited. Thank you. How well, late is it for you right now? Uh, it's midnight, which is way better because we thought it was going to be 1 a.m., but the time difference yes. that you guys have had that we haven't had yet, we have ours in two weeks, um, gained me an hour. <laughs> and can you believe that of all, because I always think of Ireland being six hours ahead. So when I was looking at that today, I thought, I don't think that's right. And then that it was just five hours, but our daylight savings was two days ago. So if you can tell by our really tired yes. eyes. <laughs> You're still recovering. <laughs> Yours is in three weeks, correct? Uh, yeah. So it was my husband who said it. He works for um, an American bank, but a branch here in Dublin, obviously. And so he's, you know, obviously on calls all the time with people wherever. And he just happened to say, I said, oh, yeah, and I've got that um bookshop event tonight and he was like oh you might want to check the time zone thing and I was like oh, oh my god so I could have been like sitting here watching tv oblivious <laughs> not clicking yeah. into the zoom at all so yeah <laughs> your husband is a hero I would yeah. have never thought of that I I in my mo own Americanized brain did not think of other countries with different dates of of daylight savings that's so crazy uh, I think we're all we're all the same though like I didn't think of it either I think we all just yeah we're all in our own bubbles always so well, yeah some, some of the states in America don't observe it so yeah. it, ah. I'm hoping that fairly soon they do away with it it's really I thought they voted I thought Congress voted and my my son was telling me this too and I thought we were done with this but here we are again just yeah. sleep deprived and not and they, sure why we're doing they it. They said that they were wanting it to be, um, to keep it daylight savings, but actually it's healthier to do when it's not daylight savings. So. Yeah, I would understand that. I mean, the light is good for us. I just think that the lack of sleep is not as fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Well, we're just so excited for you and for, you got, you've got a lot going on. I can't wait to talk to you about it. I guess we'll, we'll give everyone about another minute to pop on. So yeah. I think we had, I don't remember Allison at the end of it, but we had something like 130 people sign up for this. They were very excited. I don't oh, remember wow. the final number. Maybe Kai, our communications manager, she might be in the chat. She could tell us the final 137 number. people registered for this. Oh, she knew. Oh, wow. That's what? So lovely. That's really nice. And this is recorded. So anyone that is not here will receive it tomorrow as a recording. So it will, I mean... I feel like we've all been on a journey with this book. So I know that they'll be watching it and wanting to know all the questions. And just to remind you guys, this is a spoiler, a bounding, a spounding spoiler um, book club where we will be talking about the ending, everything. So if you haven't finished, just a warning and you can watch a recording <laughs> later. But um, that's the best thing I think about a book club is that we get to talk about the endings and ask the authors the questions we want to ask. Oh, that's good. Because so often, you know, you're at an event and you're kind of like, uh, well, I don't want to say too much and right. I won't mention this character. And so that's great. <laughs> yes. Well, and if any of y'all have any questions that um, you want ask, us to ask, feel free to put it in the chat or put it on the q and I just, I see one already. Um, oh, Lisa says, trying to say hello, but I can't quite figure out how to comment. Lisa, if you pop over to chat, you should be able to pull that up and be able to comment. But if you can't, just comment on the Q&A and we'll get to any questions that you have. Um, but yeah, like I, I think we'll start and have Elizabeth introduce you officially and then we'll go into all of our questions if that sounds good. All right. So we are thrilled tonight to be joined with Andrea Mara. She is the number one Irish Times top 10 Sunday Times and number one Kindle bestselling author who has been shortlisted for a number of awards, including the Irish Crime Novel of the Year and the Anne Post Book Awards for four of her books. Her mo most recent novel, No One Saw a Thing, was a number one bookseller in Ireland, which I bought it when I was in Galway. This Aww. Uh, and has sold over 100,000 copies, spending five months in the Irish top 10. Her no novel, All Her Fault, was Sunday Times Crime Book of the Month, a top 10 bookseller in the UK and Ireland, and a Kindle top five bookseller, bestseller. 
It has been optioned for TV. Hide and Seek charted in the Irish Times bestseller list for five weeks and was shortlisted for the Irish Crime Novel of the Year in 2022. Her next novel, Someone in the Attic, will be published this year in the UK and Ireland on June the 6th and in the United States on August the 20th. She lives in Dublin, Ireland with her husband and three children, and she gets a special um, jewel in her crown for joining us at midnight her time tonight. So welcome, Andrea. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I wanted to give a little um, how I found this book. So I think I was perusing something somewhere and and just saw the premise. And I have a special place in my heart for Irish crime. It's just my favorite. Uh, so I read the premise and I thought I have got to get my hands on this book. And I just poured through it very, a long time ago and have been begging my U.S. publishers forever to get this book. Like this is a book we need here. Well, I finally figured out how to get it from a, a publishing house in the UK uh, to bring it to Fable. It took four months. Good. I, I, I'm here to testify because I was copied on those emails of her begging and I saying, was, Eat it I, needs to be here. <laughs> so I think somebody picked up the books in Ireland and then walked across the Atlantic. <laughs> That's how long it took. Yeah, but uh, we have we we got 150 copies in in, in January, and we only have I think 17 left. So oh wow, that's so amazing, and we're we're thrilled. So I, and then I heard, of course, we'll, I want to talk a little bit later about it being um, option for a TV show, which I'm pretty sure that I had something to do with that. So. <laughs> <laughs> So um, can you just, some of us, of course, I read it a, a long time ago. Allison just finished it. But can you just kind of refresh everyone's memory of the plot of All Her Fault? Yep, sure. So it's about Marissa who goes to collect her son Milo from a play date. And it's Milo's first time going to this other boy's house. Um, they're only small. They've just started school. And when Marissa turns up to collect her son, a stranger answers the door. And this woman who answers the door has never heard of her son Milo and knows nothing about a play date. So, of course, then panic ensues as Marissa tries to understand, has she come to the wrong house? What's going on? Where's her son? Who organized the play date? And uh, she and her husband, Peter, have to find their son. Um, so, yeah, that's the the opening. Nightmare. Yes. What an opening it was. I remember starting to read this and I was like, OK, deep breaths um, as a mother. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much your nightmare, um, because the beginning of it is a hook and an absolute like gut punch, especially to mothers. Um, is when you started this book, is this also your worst nightmare? Is this? something you like to do as far as writing your worst nightmares yeah it is and like um I only started writing crime novels in the last six or seven years and my kids so it was after having kids my kids are 16 14 and 12 so it is all those fears that I've had since becoming a parent and it's a way of it's like free therapy just mm -hmm. write them down in a book and get rid of them that way so that's kind of where it comes from it's whatever is worrying me most at any given moment in time take it put it in a book and get rid of it that way um, but that one it was it, it wasn't just a made-up idea it was something that really happened um I had um my middle child had gone on a play date in a friend's house and she was five at the time and it was her first year at school we call it junior infants over here and um I went to pick her up and called at the house and there was no answer and I rang the doorbell again still no answer and then I peered in through the glass panels at the side of the front door and I could see the house was completely empty so not just no people but no furniture so nobody lived in the house and I just had this moment of sheer panic where I was going oh my god where's my child they've they've stolen my child my child's been kidnapped and like thinking back I feel like that was a bit of a reach because you know kind of playing a long game if they start their own five-year-old in junior infants and spend months and months in school with what their fake five-year-old getting ready to kidnap my five-year-old I mean the, you know it didn't make any sense but just in that moment I thought oh my god they've kidnapped my child and then all it was is that the family had moved house 
Um, so when the school started, we were all we all gave our addresses to make it easier for play dates. And I don't think you can even do that now with GDPR. But this is like nine years ago. And so I had this like laminated sheet with all the addresses on it that I used to keep in the glove compartment of the car being really super organized. I'm not going to need to text the parents for their address. I'm just going to use this laminated sheet and, you know, they had moved house. So that's why the, the laminated sheet was no good in this instance. That is fascinating. I want to recommend a book to, for you because of that, because one of our favorite authors, she's the Texas author, Elizabeth Crook wrote The Witch Way Tree, and it is based on her son getting lost in the Texas wilderness. And when they found him, the um, Texas Rangers said that they knew there was a panther in the area and it was stalking her son. So she did the same thing as far as you, like free therapy, what if, and she wrote an excellent book that is one of our favorites here. Uh Hmm. Very good. I'll keep a note of that. That's terrifying though. (laughs) You're absolutely terrifying, I guess. (laughs) I, I thought I can read serial killer books, all, you know, right before I go to bed with my husband out of town, but books like this are the ones that are, give me the sheer panic. So I, it's, it's very, it was just fantastic, but there are, there's a lot of themes in this book with mommy guilt and the feeling of being at fault. And I'm, I was wondering if you could kind of expand on that a little bit. And I also wonder if your expertise, because apparently you, you have an award-winning parent and lifestyle blog, which I am I just now have heard about. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that, but did, did that inform some of the themes in the book that a lot of mothers struggle with? Yeah, exactly. So um, I it, it was something when my kids were small and I was working full time, I had three small kids. They were all in crash. Um, I don't know. if What do you call crash? Child care anyway. Um, and um, I used to just worry all the time. I was like, oh, my God, am I doing the right thing? Is this going to be bad that they are all in full time child care and I'm working? Or, you know, what am I supposed to do? Because they want my job and my husband wants his job and we need two incomes. So that constant struggle and guilt and the realization, too, that my husband, although he was amazing at like we did everything 50 50, you know, we both pitched in. There was no such thing as one person doing more of the like getting the kids organized in the morning or cooking dinner in the evening. But the big difference was he didn't feel guilty. He didn't worry about being at work the way I did. So um, I started blogging. The blog was Office Mum. And it was, again, free therapy, just a way of getting it out of my system, but also kind of screaming out into the the ether kind of going, is anyone else feeling this? What's going on? What is the solution? What are we supposed to do? And finding other people who were in the same situation and wanted to talk about it, which was like most people, because, you know, I'd say about 60% of Irish mothers work full-time or part-time. So like it, it, there's this big majority of people who are struggling with it, but too busy to even talk about it kind of thing. Um, So that's where the blog came from. And then not deliberately, but it just happens then in each of my books, those, some of those themes wind up in there. So yeah, like it was, um, it, it was probably always going to slip into all her fault because Marissa um, works, her husband works and they have a child and they have a nanny. And then the other main character, Jenny, same thing. It's two parents, although in her case, she's got the bigger job and her husband uh, doesn't earn as much as her. Um, and then they have a son as well. And she's got a nanny too. So they're experiencing some of those things, the guilt and the worry and the, you know, is my child okay with the nanny? And then obviously no, cause, <laughs> um, the nanny has taken the child. Um, and then the other side of all of the, so you've got the guilt, but then there's the blame and the fault side. And I, I think that it's very common today that we look for people to blame when anything goes wrong. You know, we see a news story and with the best will in the world, you still find yourself going, okay, but where were they when that happened? Almost, you need to kind of be able to say, that person to whom that awful thing happened, they were somewhere I wouldn't go. So it's it wouldn't happen to me. We have to reassure ourselves. So sometimes I think it can turn into victim blaming then, you know, well, if she hadn't left her child with the nanny, the nanny wouldn't have stolen the child kind of thing. So, um, 
you know, the, there's four women in the book, all of whom are blamed at various points. I mean, Carrie quite justifiably blamed since she did take the child, uh, but she had her own tragic past as well. And Irene, who wasn't a very good um, mother in the first instance. And then um, obviously Marissa and Jenny, there's people kind of gossiping about them behind their backs as well. And, you know, did she not do a good background check on the nanny and how could she have hired her and all that stuff? And I, I do think there's a little bit of that everywhere, that kind of blaming thing, looking for someone on whom to pin the blame when anything goes wrong. And then, um, of course, in the end, it's Peter. It's it's not any of the four women. Ultimately, it's Peter who who started the whole thing that turned into this avalanche of trouble for everybody else so um that I liked that with the title being all her fault but in fact in the end um it was his fault and so someone someone did message me on Instagram once and said but why did you call it all her fault when it was all his fault in the end (laughs) that's that's the point yeah Yeah. Well, this is somewhat of a large question, so feel free to break it down as much as you want. Um, I'd love to talk to thrillers, thriller authors about their process in writing the book. Do you already know what's going to happen at the end? Do you work backwards? Does it piece it together in the middle, especially with the twist here? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of that. So I always work it out in advance, like with all her fault. I remember my son was at an occupational therapy appointment and I was sitting to the side, letting them do their thing. And I was like in productive mode. I was like, I have to maximize every hour of the day because life is so busy. Um, so I was like, OK, I'm going to plot out this new book that I was calling The Play Date at the time. And I knew it was going to be inspired by the real life event. A woman calls to collect her child. And um, her child isn't there. And I was like, okay, so where's the child? And I remember literally within the hour of the occupational therapy appointment, I had decided that it was going to be um, the nanny who took the child, but it was all caused ultimately by the dad and that there was going to be the baby switch, um, the car accident from years ago. So all of that was decided within the first hour. And then the rest of it um, all the other kind of subplots and side stories, they they come just along the way then as I'm writing it. But I have to know the ending before I start writing because I think my biggest fear, apart from my child being kidnapped at a play date, is that I would write a whole book and get to the end and then go, oh, I don't know. I don't know who did it. So, I mean, that'd be awful. <laughs> so I have to, have to know that beforehand. Makes sense. Um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about the characters in the book. Now, first of all, Esther was my favorite. I still think about her all this time later. And just to know that ultimately she was just a a good mom and a a good woman trying to help out. So um, do you, do you feel like every character got justice in the end? Were you really happy with how each character wound up in the story? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, Esther is um, an interesting example because I really liked Esther too. And I wanted her to be a fairy godmother character who is just good and who just minds Jenny and just looks after other people. Because I think there are people like that sort of everywhere and they're not always the most obvious people, but they are there in all our worlds and they're just good people who just are kind and look out for others. And then my editor, um, so when she sent me back editorial notes, she was like, Esther's got to earn her place on the page. So she's either a suspect or she goes. And I was like, what? So um, the second draft yeah. then involved a little bit more about Esther. Just a, there's not much suspicion on her, but just enough so that somebody reading it might go, oh, what's Esther up to? Is there, you know, is it, does she have some involvement in this? Um, so yeah, like I hope, I hope that the ending is satisfying and that, you know, I, I, I think that, um, Peter got his just desserts in the, the epilogue part at the end with the shellfish. And obviously, um, I do feel, I feel sorry for Carrie. I mean, you you shouldn't go around stealing other people's children, but, um, she, she had a, she had a hard tragic past and um not excusing what she did at all but like you know she it doesn't end well for her so um 
yeah, I guess you can't you can't save everybody either, though, or it's probably not going to be the most realistic book. Yeah, I did. I I when when there was some suspicion with Esther, I thought, no, 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 <laughs> do this to her. So I'm, I loved how you wrapped up her story. Oh, good. Yeah. I loved how Peter got his in the end being allergic to shellfish and how they were worried about Milo also being allergic because it's, you know, hereditary. Um, so Milo and Carrie both have um, synesthesia, which I have. I, and I didn't know this until an adult. So, yeah, which is, same. Um, so when he was like, Monday is blue, I was like, Monday is red. Also math is red <laughs> and I, my daughter has it. And we just love to like call out things like what colors are they or um, numbers or genders, evens or girls, odds or boys. Like there's uh-huh. just weird rules in our mind that make sense to us. But yeah. I would love to hear like, how, how, what are your thought process in including this? You say you have it, which I would love to hear more about. Um, and that being the connecting point between Carrie and Milo. Yeah. So I needed something um, like, you know, as we know, as readers of crime books, you can't just have an ending that was not foreshadowed. There has to be, you have to leave clues for the reader to give a reader a fair chance to work out the answer. And obviously you don't want all the readers to work out all the answers, but I think it's fair that some readers get to work out some of the answers. Um, Or at the very least, you want readers to get to the end and go, ah, of course, the synesthesia. So there was a link. So they were related. So I needed something that was hereditary or sometimes hereditary um, that could link Milo and Carrie, but not something like super obvious either. And I was kind of going through in my head the different things that it might be and just brainstorming it out on a piece of paper. And then I thought about synesthesia because I have it. And I I got in contact with a guy I know. I had actually, I had just been on a TV show in Ireland talking about synesthesia um, and with this guy. And um, he's an expert in neuro conditions. And so I was like, hang on a sec, maybe this would work in the book. So I asked him, is it hereditary? And he said, like, you know, not everything is known and not all of the time, but it's reasonably hereditary that you could use it in the way you want to use it. So that's why I put it in. And then it was fun to do because like you, I only discovered I had synesthesia as an adult because I thought everybody saw um, days of the week in color and was really shocked to discover that wasn't the case. So it was fun to put it into the book. It's for you. Does it just extend days of the week or do, is it more? There are more. Elements? Oh, it, it would be like a lot of people. I, it, to me, it's any abstract words. So days of the week, numbers, um, letters of the alphabet, um, people's names, yeah. and it just anything that's abstract. Like, you know, if, if you say apple, I'll picture an apple. But if you say wind, I we don't know what wind looks like. So I'll see wind in color. So I think that's what my brain is doing, just applying a color to something if it doesn't already have a, a kind of a typical color. It's so fun. I love it. It is. It is. It's good fun. Didn't, uh, Allison, didn't, you, didn't you say that, that green is my color? Yeah, you are green. Elizabeth is green. I think of people in colors and, and it's funny to like talk to someone else who knows others and some like this, who has uh, synesthesia and we will agree that the same person is the same color. Ah. (laughs) There has to be some truth in it. If we're both saying that this person is purple. (laughs) We had a question from the audience. So was uh, from Amber, was there any connection between Jenny and Kyle? Because they both made the comment, Marissa should end up somewhere kind where her world fail, falls apart. So I kept thinking they were somehow related. No, no. But I do love when people pick up on extra things that weren't in there to, to begin with. So that's, yeah, but no, they weren't. Okay. Allison. Oh, great. Um, Yes. One um, things that we love in our Zoom chats is with authors is that spoilers abound. Our viewers have usually read the book ahead of time, so nothing is off limits. Is there anything you want to discuss about the end of the book that you were not able to do um, with signings? Since normally book signings, you don't get to talk about the spoilers. I know, especially we have um, one of our customers um, texted me and was like, we need to talk about this last paragraph 
where um, mother-in-law of Richie um, writes a letter and puts it in, I think it's bedside table. And I was like trying to make the connection. I was like, yes. And she was like, I just need more clarification on that. Um, but I would love to ha- like hear more about um, kind of the way you end the story or if there, if there is anything that you would have changed or if anybody comes to you with questions about certain things about the ending. Um, so I, like I like, and in all my books, I like to wrap up the ending by visiting each of the characters and giving them a little, you know, ending. And that, that might be a happy ending, um, like Esther, or it might be a bad ending like Peter or it might be just um, a secret is revealed. So the mother-in-law is the one writing the letters um, all along. Um, So sometimes there are small side stories that are designed to create some intrigue and maybe to be a red herring to mislead the reader, but you, you do wanna wrap them up at the end. And when you're explaining the big stuff, like who, took Milo why she took Milo all that's all that stuff people aren't going to be too worried about yeah but who was writing the letters but you still want to be able to wrap all of that up at the end so um that's probably my favorite part um and I started doing that with all her faults when I did that and in each of my three or four books that I've written since um I do that I have a little kind of visit to each of the characters to give them an ending and yeah I think that's my favorite book but or favorite part but that might be too because it means the book is finished if I can be <laughs> doing that part it makes yeah. sense Leon Moriarty did that in um I think the the good husband or the husband secret and I loved I loved that that was my favorite part of the book too so now we are so excited to hear that Peacock announced that all her fault will be a limited series have yep. you been uh, involved in the casting or any of the the plot direction of the story? Um, so they, um, I was sent a script for the pilot a few months ago. So this was when um, they, so Carnival are the production company and they had hired a screenwriter and she'd written the pilot episode and they were in talks with Peacock at the time and they sent me, or maybe not yet, but you know, somewhere around then, they sent me the script to have a look. So that was kind of amazing to be sitting reading my own words, but in a script and in the beginning, now I'm sure it could all change by the time it really gets um produced but um at the at that stage anyway the script was the real dialogue from the opening chapter when marissa calls to esther's house and i was like oh my god those are words that i wrote and now they're coming out of the mouths of these soon to be on tv characters so that that was really really enjoyable um and then i hadn't heard anything for a few months and then i was sitting at home on valentine's night with my husband and my son we were watching a movie and my phone started to ring at about 9 30 and i was like who is ringing me i mean nobody rings we just text 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 <laughs> and um it was my agent ringing so i was like okay, I've either been cancelled or this is something interesting. And I don't really do cancelable things. So um, I answered and she was like, look at your email, look at your email. And I was going, I I can't see my email. It's on my phone and I'm on my phone to you. And she was like, oh my goodness, I'll tell you what it says. And it was a link to Variety with an announcement um, of uh, Peacock going straight to series with all her faults. So that was a really, really, really surreal moment. And um, I am going to London on Thursday this week to have a celebratory lunch with the production company and my TV agent. And I'm hoping to find out things at that stage. Um, But right now, I don't know anything at all about cast or when filming will start or anything like that. But I can't wait for Thursday because um, I'm like really, really, really dying to find out more about that. I yeah. can't imagine. What that I had a like. bunch of people texting me also because they were they know how much I love your book, so, <laughs> so they were very excited to, that it was going to be a a TV show. So congratulations for that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, it's probably the most exciting thing that's ever happened to me. So um, yeah, I'm really, really excited. And it was funny because sorry, there was just a some class of a creature flying past me. Um, <laughs> it was um. 
when I put the news on Instagram and I was like, you know, mostly I'm posting about book stuff on Instagram um, and the odd thing about cake or my kids or whatever, um, but mostly book stuff. And then I put the TV stuff up and it, it like it was so much more interesting to everybody <laughs> than any book stuff I've ever put up. So it's like, OK, we can see what people are interested in. It's TV. But I think people are just into the excitement of the whole thing, like because it, it's yeah, we all grow up with TV. So the idea of having something on TV is really fun. It's almost validating that it's a, a fantastic story. I mean, we already knew that, but yeah. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Well, once it's, you get that kind of email, I would feel like it'd be very tempting to start casting people in your mind. Are you, can, are you as evolved you can resist that temptation or have in your mind have you decided oh it'd be really great if this person could <laughs> I I haven't done it and I don't know if it's just because I guess maybe it's sort of a thing where I, I don't want to get carried away thinking like oh my gosh imagine if it was this person or that person and the reality is like I know they use they use tv actors you know it's not going to be big name Hollywood stars. So maybe that's a protective thing on my part that I'm not letting myself get carried away imagining, oh, if it could be this person or that person, when really they, they will be people I won't know. It, it'll be filmed in, uh, I, I don't know where it'll be filmed, but I think it'll be set in Chicago. So it's going to be very much over with you guys um, and not over here. So um, I, I think it will be people I haven't heard of. Um, but yeah, I'll find out Thursday. It's yeah. so amazing. Well, and I feel like it would be tempting to think about big stars too, because big stars do end up doing these kinds of mini series. Like you, Kate Winslet did the Mary Beast town Reese Witherspoon. So I'm, um, I, I think it'll be good regardless of who yes. is, acting. but it would yeah. be very tempting for me to just be like this person, this person, this is <laughs> I agree to no less than them. Um, <laughs> but I would love to hear just as an Irish author, um, what is it like to be picked up at, by a U.S. publisher and um, and especially just a really great one? Another very surreal pinch me moment. And again, that was my uh, agent was trying to phone me and I was at the GP, the like doctor, pediatrician with my daughter and um, we were in the waiting room. So I couldn't answer the phone and I was messaging her back going, I can't answer. I'm in a waiting room. But again, thinking, oh, my God, why is she ringing me? This is you know, something big. And um, so she was messaging me saying, look, this is what's happening. And there's um, two big publishers interested and we're talking and we'll be back soon and you'll have to pick immediately. And I was like, wait, what? And she was like, this is the way they do it. You have to pick tonight. <laughs> so that was incredible. Um, so we had like Zoom meetings with the two publishers and I had no idea. I was like, I don't know how to make this decision. And you just go off the, like the vibe of the Zoom call really. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I ended up signing with Pamela Dorman Books who are part of Penguin um, in the US. And that's really nice as well because I'm with Transworld in the UK who are also part of Penguin. So they're all part of the same big, huge umbrella company. And I think that does make things easier for everybody. Um, and my editor in the UK gets on very well with my US editor. And um, that has all made everything much very smooth as well. So it's yeah, it's, it's just a whole other world. I mean, I grew up watching American TV, reading American books, reading Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys and Stephen King and Virginia Andrews and Christopher Pike and Point Horror books, Jeffrey Deaver, like obsessed with American books and American TV. And I've been over many times and we have like every Irish person, we have um, family over there as well who moved over there in like the 1920s and have their big families spread out all over America. So I would say I'm borderline obsessed with America and all things American. So the fact that I'm going to have a book on bookshelves over there is kind of amazing. Well, I already do <laughs> in your shop, thanks to you, but also now in other shops. <laughs> I know I, I kept telling my, uh, this my, my penguin rep, I want to get all her fault. How am I going to do this when it was just Penguin UK? And when he was pitching me your book, Someone in the Attic, I'm like, I have already told you about Adria Mara. We already, we're, 
So um, I told you this was a good author. So, and when I saw it was Pamela Dorman, I thought, way to go, Andrea. That's, there's a couple of, there's a couple of uh, publishers that I, I mean, they're all great, but there's a couple of them when, when their names are behind it, you know, it's, yeah. a big, so that's a big oh, deal. That's yeah. good to hear. That's good. And they, they, they have Shari Lipena as well. And I got to meet her in Harrogate, which is a literary festival in the UK last year. And she was so amazing and so lovely. And I was like, can't go wrong signing with the same publisher as Shari Lipena, really. So, yeah. Well, and I think that I, I had um, drinks with Catherine Ryan Howard. Mm -hmm. I think she was with you that day and she yeah. left them have drinks with me, but you know, I, you're saying you love all you know American things. I love Irish things. We have Joe Spain, Catherine Ryan Howard, uh, Liz Nugent. Now we've got your books, and um, you know I would love to know. Give you a second to think about any other any other Irish crime authors that you really love that maybe we need to be aware of here in the states. But ah. while, while you're thinking about that, because I don't want to put you on the spot. Can you tell us a little bit about um, Someone in the Attic? It's coming out in August. Mm -hmm. and as soon as we have our big reading um, event next, or we do like a reading guide, as soon as that's finished in a couple of weeks, that's one of the very first books I'm going to read. So I haven't read it yet, but can you, can you give everyone a sneak peek on your U.S. debut? Yeah. Um, so it's about... Um... There's a viral video trend where people are pretending to creep out of attics and creep around people's houses. So they're, they're just fake videos where people, you know, one of these things people do. And um, this family who've just moved from San Diego back to Dublin are the, the daughter is looking at her phone and she's like, mom, mom, look at this video. And her mom is busy. And she's like, I, I need to do this. I'll look at it in a minute. She's like, mom, it's our house. And the mom looks at the video and it is, it's their house. So it looks like somebody has created one of these videos for this viral trend showing someone letting themselves out of the attic all dressed in black and then creeping around their house but they haven't let anyone into the house so they start to worry little by little that you know could it be real and they're like no 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 it has to be photoshopped there couldn't be someone in our attic but um then it does appear to be the case that there is someone in the attic so that's what it's in a nutshell a family who come to believe there is someone living in their attic and of course, there are dark secrets from their past. And, you know, they're trying to work out, well, look, if someone is targeting us, even if it is, you know, photoshopping and clever editing, someone is clearly trying to upset us here. So why are they doing it? And is it linked to this thing that happened in the past or this thing that happened even further back? And of course, there are clues and red herrings and you get to play along to try to work out what's going on. Right. so good that sounds exciting um well we are just getting to know your work even though um you are already a pr prolific writer in ireland can you give us kind of a synopsis of your backlist um for those of us that just need more sure yeah um so um after all her fault i wrote hide and seek which is about um yet again one of my worst fears so it's about a game of hide and seek where one of the children is never found and then uh 20 or 30 years later i can't remember now um a, a new family move into the house where from where the little girl went missing and the woman who moves into the house starts googling the story because she's quite taken aback to realize that they've bought this house where a child went missing with this tragic past and when she googles the story she sees a picture of the missing child and the end of the first chapter is she says I think I know Lily Murphy I think I killed her and that's the like the opening of the book um and then I wrote um no one saw a thing um which is about a family who are on vacation in London and they're getting the tube and the two little daughters age six and two get on the tube and the tube doors close before the mom can get on the tube and the tube takes off with the two daughters on it. So <laughs> the mom is in a panic and um, people are radioing ahead to the next station and then they go, okay, come to the next station. Everything is okay. We have them and she gets to the next station and her two-year-old is there um, and she's like, where's Faye, her six-year-old? And 
the staff is like, who's Faye? And nobody has seen the six year olds. So that's no one saw a thing. Um, and then I have three other books um, who were with a small Irish publisher um, before that. Um, sorry, I'm just going to grab my water because I left it over here. I'll be you don't drink a little bit of water. Don't no worry. It's, it's important. important to be water hydrated. break. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, the, the first one is called The Other Side of the Wall. And it's about um, a woman who starts to worry that something has happened to the people who live next door. Um, because she used to hear noises from next door all the time. And they're very, we call them semi-detached houses, but I don't know what they're called in America, like houses that are joined together. Like a duplex? Um, yeah. And or and the walls are quite thin. So normally she can hear her neighbors all the time. And then she realizes she hasn't heard anything in a while. And she's like, I think something's happened to the people next door. And everyone's like, oh, you know, you're just sleep deprived because you have a newborn baby. And um but of course she's right. Something has happened. Um, and then I wrote um, One Click, which is about a woman who takes a photo of a stranger on a beach and she puts it online, not really thinking anything about it, but it um, causes a kind of a snowball effect because somebody sees that photo and starts trying to track down the woman and is, you know, so you don't know what it is about this woman on the beach. Um, that is so important to this other person who's targeting her. And then the last one is um, the third one with my previous publisher it's called The Sleeper Lies. And it's about um, a snowstorm and a woman wakes up in the morning and there's footprints on the snow outside her house that make that are right up to her window as somebody as though someone was peering in her window in the middle of the night. Um, so that that one's kind of a creepy one. Um, yeah, so that's all of them. I, I love your creativity. Yes. <laughs> I love that you go there. We're all, maybe we've already thought about it, but you're like, let's, let's tackle it. Let's just go there for sure. <laughs> okay. I'm giving you some time. So can you think of any, any Irish crime, either Irish crime books or authors? Cause I know you are a tight pack. I feel like just yeah. knowing Catherine, like I do, it sounds like she's, I mean, she's always with at literary festivals and, um, yeah, so just wanted to pick your brain on that. Yeah, um, so there's a fabulous writer called Amanda Cassidy. Um, and she has two books out. One is called Breaking and one is called The Returned. Um, she's with a UK publisher called Canelo. And um, her books are fabulous, beautifully written, especially The Returned is really, really good. Um, do you know Jane Casey? Oh, good grief. Yes. How did I forget Jane Casey? I love the Maeve Kerrigan series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm going to her launch tomorrow night, actually, for her new one, which is very, very good. I read a, a copy of it a few months ago. Um, and then there's um, Andrea Carter. Have you heard of her? She, she writes to get I know they're in a show the in yeah. a series and they're hard to get here. But yes, I have. You really know your stuff. <laughs> thing. I have read, but I have read the the first in the Inishowen series or Inishowen. Uh huh. Um, trying to think. Oh, I'm I'm basically thinking about our nights out and thinking about who's at them. Oh, we have Sam Blake as well. Her most recent book is Three Little Birds. She actually has about ten books, um, with Atlantic, and before that she was with Bonnier um and she's like she's an author but she's also very active like she's the new chair of the society of authors in the UK and she runs a writing business and a scouting business and so she she has many hats as well as writing books and writes YA now as well um who else is there Amy Jordan is um a cork writer who has uh, three books with the same small Irish publisher that I was with before but she's just signed a lovely new deal with, I think it's Harper Collins in the States, maybe Harper Collins in the UK as well. Um, so that's very exciting. That's going to be a big change for her. Um, that might be all. Oh, we have. Oh, yeah. And this one could be interesting too. There's a writer called Michelle McDonough, and she writes um, what is has been coined rural noir, which is like her books are set in like small Irish towns and very rural, but like, of course, murder as well. So um, yeah, really good books as yeah. well. 
Phil McDonough. Um, I yeah. love thinking about um, the idea that all of you guys are having these nights out and no one would know. Like, I feel like anyone, anything that would like nefarious that would happen to you, you guys have already thought of it. So you are <laughs> on guard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like sometimes on a night out, something will happen and we'll be like, oh, one of us should write a book about that. And then we're like, eh. And we just carry on talking. <laughs> That's good. Nobody's competitive about that. That's so funny. <laughs> well, thank you. There's, there's a couple here I'm going to explore and I'm going to make sure. I, I feel like um, Fabled is Irish Crime South. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have Brilliant. quite a good display for St. Patrick's Day of all celebrating all our Irish authors. Oh, yes. Love it. Fabulous. We have a question from the audience from Lisa who said she loved the way the police counselor treated questioning Milo, which I agree. That was a very kind way. Did um, you have any research going in of kind of handling that specific scene? Yeah. So I have um, a friend through my son's class whose husband is a police detective here in Ireland and I did get to sit down with him and ask him questions now like he was able to tell me that they would have specially trained interviewers to interview children so they would have people they're just regular Gardaí but they've had this additional training so that they can do that he's never done it himself so we we kind of worked together to come up with like by googling a lot of it is googling and sitting together with him to come up with how she would do that um so yeah well that's nice to hear that uh that it came across um as it should in the book absolutely Mm -hmm. um well i'd love to hear are you working on anything next that we need to know about indeed um yes so i just got um edits back yesterday on next year's book which is called the wrong house um so I like I have I don't think I've put anything on social media about this or anything yet so you're the first to know Mm -hmm. um so yeah like it's the it, it really needs a good whipping into shape still at this stage it's only at second draft stage but it's basically about a woman who gets a google alert on her phone announcing her own death that's probably the the easiest way to just summarize it and that might be that might not be what is the strap line or the blurb in the end but that's just where it's at at the moment will that be a few i'm already hooked or is it it, will that be in the united states yes yes it will yeah and what do you like to read in your do you read a lot in your free time do you read thrillers or do you read um literary fiction what do you what do you uh, gravitate toward I read a lot of crime. A lot of what I'm reading in print are books that I'm sent advanced copies being asked for blurb quotes. So that tends to be almost exclusively crime. And I listen to audiobooks a lot as well. So I'd always have the print book sometimes can feel like it's work because I'm trying to read as quickly as possible to get the blurb quote across. And there's always a big pile, whereas the audio book is pure leisure because those are not advanced copies. Those are just books that I, um, that people recommended. So they, the audio books could be anything. They tend, they tend to be the big name book clubby type books or the kind of the ones everyone is talking about or um sometimes I'll listen to audiobooks because I might think that could be a big heavy book if I was reading the print but I can let someone tell me the story in my ear and it will be much easier so I loved like um uh Demon Copperhead um I listened to the audio of that that was fabulous and The Small Mercies by Dennis Lehane and uh, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow listened to that on audio as well loved it um the one I'm listening to at the moment is um the one what is it called I Have Some Questions for You I think is the title it's very good as well so um yes I love I read anything really, but um, it probably tends towards crime. Have you read The Woman on the Ledge by Ruth Mancini? Yes, it's very good. Really good. At this point, it's it's my favorite book I've read this year. Yeah, yeah, it's very good, isn't it? I it last year, so don't worry. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's so twisty and good. It's one of my, yeah. I loved it. And I love that you can tell on the very first page, it's going to be good. Like, I just, I love that feeling when you read the first page and you go, oh, I like this voice. I'm going to enjoy this book. Mm -hmm. Very good. 
Well, mm -hmm. I'm just so thrilled that you um, said that you would join us tonight. We have loved selling your book and we love just being booksellers. It's really fun to champion authors who are not as well known. Of course, I mean, I don't think you're very well known in Ireland, but it's something that we love to be on the front end um, in the United States, supporting you, cheering you on, and we will be definitely um, selling your books with gusto. Oh, thank you. So true. Thank you so much. If you don't mind sticking around for a couple of minutes, um, we're just going to have a few little announcements about some upcoming events for Fabled. Mm -hmm. uh, for our April book club, we are still getting details for our next author. So um, stay tuned for that book, that author. We will send anyone who is has signed up for this particular Zoom, we'll send you an email about who that ends up to be. It'll be a big reveal, which will be fun. But um, before that, we'll be having one of our events that we are known for that we as our favorite events of that we do during the year is uh, the book review where Elizabeth and myself will go through the best books in our opinion that are coming out January through April. And that will be on March 25th. Is that correct? <laughs> yes. I'm putting all the links in the chat for you to sign up. Um, it's so much fun. We, uh, really try to um, give you guys the bet the books that you should spend your time on. We also give spicy takes the books that you do not need to spend your time on, which always ends up being everyone's favorite part because we do it right in the middle where our minds are kind of glue at that point and it becomes very spicy as far as what we have to say. Um, but we also have an incredibly exciting author joining us for May. We're kind of um, beside ourselves about it. Kristen Hanna will be joining us for the women. So I've posted that link to sign up in the chat as well. We'd love for you to join us. And that will be usually um, are at seven o'clock central time. Uh, for our book club, but that one will be at six. So what Kristen Hannah wants, she gets. So she wanted to <laughs> post, we said, sure. <laughs> but we would love <laughs> you guys to sign up for that. And also the link to purchase that book is also in the chat as well. So yeah, that's it. Thank you again for joining us at midnight. That is such compliments to us that you would you would take the time out to answer all of our questions and um, just know that we are championing you from across the pond. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for asking me. I love just the idea of, I am so happy to stay up till midnight. I love everything American and I love getting to talk to you guys all the way over there. And isn't modern technology amazing that we can just do this? So I love that. And uh, yeah, thank you for bringing all her fault to America single-handedly. <laughs> yes, when I find it, I'm like, don't tell me no. We're going to find a way to get in there. We did. So anyway, we'll have, a, have a wonderful evening and I'm sure we'll, again, we'll be cheering you on this summer. Thank you so much. Good night. Bye.